All right, ready to go? Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, okay, this is my talk. It's about live migration at HP Public Cloud. Uh, I'm Matthew. I work on the Nova team in Bristol, England. Uh, I guess I've been working on OpenStack for 18 months, because when I joined, all my uh, now colleagues were at the Hong Kong Summit uh, having fun. So uh, this talk specifically is about our experience using live migration uh, at quite large scale in our public cloud during 2014-15. Uh, so this is like an ops war story uh, for doing that. Uh, I guess most of you must know that HP has a public cloud. It's pretty big in terms of OpenStack public clouds. We've got two data centers and thousands of uh, compute nodes, and obviously like control plane to back it up. And naturally, it's running OpenStack. Uh, we've had public clouds since Diablo, although luckily we don't run Diablo anymore. Uh, yeah. Um, Libvirt, KVM, Kemu for the hypervisor stack. Neutron, I guess, is perhaps not so uncommon anymore, but we were early adopters of that. Uh, we run Cinder with a custom driver called Bock for some HP storage hardware and like a minimal amount of local patches. I'll go into some details later about some of the patches we had to carry for live migration. Um, yeah, and like a word about our design decisions within the OpenStack cloud. So we choose to stack instances. We have these thousands of nodes, and with thousands of instances, we try and like compress them onto as few nodes as possible, which um, gives us the flexibility because we've got empty hardware, so we could recommission it if we needed it for something else. And it also like leaves space for large instances to land rather than like half filling everything and then not being able to land our larger flavors. Uh, and the other thing that's worth mentioning because it's going to be relevant later on is uh, that we use ephemeral uh, instance disks. So we download the image from Glance, and it sits on the compute node next to the hypervisor. If you've been to any of the other talks about live migration this week, they might have told you that uh, live migration with ephemeral instance disks is a pretty bad idea, <laughs> and, um, and given some reasons why. And I guess you'll uh, understand in depth by the end why it's a bad idea. <laughs> Not really. OK. So, uh, about live migration. When I first heard about live migration, I thought it pretty much sounds like magic. You have a compute node running a hypervisor, running a VM, and then the VM moves over to another compute node, like a f different physical hardware with no interruption to the guest OS, and like very minimal interruption even to the external communication with the instance. And that, like, that seems pretty amazing to me, um, but unfortunately, not actually magic. It, uh, it's done with computers, and these are like complicated machines with, with complicated uh, failure modes, and uh, you'll hear about that, right? Um, so I mentioned about the ephemeral disks. That means we're doing um, what's, uh, what's called block migration, right? Which means we have to copy during a live migration not just the contents of the memory, like you would if you were using shared storage, but we also have to copy the disk of the image, right? And that's why... People say it's maybe not such a good idea because it's slow because you have to do that. So like in detail, during a live migration, there's a pre-live migrate step where OpenStack uh, works out if the live migration is possible and tries to set up, well, it tells the hypervisor libvert to uh, set up the connection like peer-to-peer -peer between the compute nodes. Then uh, a sort of snapshot of the disk and the uh, memory is sent across. And whilst that's happening, that's sent across the target. Whilst that's happening, like more activity is happening on the uh, source node because that's where the instance is still running. So when that finishes, like there's some dirty memory and some dirty disk which needs to be synced across like again. And then that might happen again and again and again. And then eventually, if all goes well, the instance is briefly paused, uh, like sub-second pause while uh, things like networks are switched over, volumes are reattached on the target node, and then everything gets unpaused, the instance is running on the target node, and your live migration has been successful. Uh, right, so what did we do? So you've heard maybe about live migration. Typical, cause, typical reasons why people want to do it are if you've got some impending hardware failure that you know about, you want to uh, evacuate a host, or if you've got uh, some like OS or BIOS or like firmware patches that you need to apply, which would 
mean shutting down the, the node that the instances are running on. So uh, now our case, which I'm going to talk about today, was the second of those, right? For security and for compliance reasons, we want to keep uh, minimum, no, maximum age. We want, to, we want to be updating all our compute nodes every three months to take advantage of like security and OS improvements. Uh, but our customers' instances have uptimes greater than three months, right? So we use the live migration to move the workload around and be able to update these nodes, right? So we decided that we were going to try a rolling live migration of all the instances across these thousands of nodes uh, across the whole data center every three months. Uh, the way we decided to do this was to basically pick, like, a host and migrate all its instances to an identically spec'd host. So rather than doing the kind of live migration where you fire off the request back to the scheduler and have it just put somewhere else, we're just doing like host to host migration. Uh, that, come, that you know will become relevant later as well. So, oh, it's down there, cool. Yeah, first step, like work out uh, if it's even possible, do some testing. Right? And because we're doing block migration, the biggest thing is about the disk size. Uh, specifically, we're using uh, copy-on-write images from Glance. So you download the image, and then you've got like your overlay on the top. And that's the bit that Libvert wants to migrate over. It doesn't copy the read-only underlay bit. In fact, it doesn't copy read-only disks at all. Uh, come back to that later. Uh, and of course, like I said about the dirtying of pages over and over, that will like obviously cause things to to, uh, to slow down, right? So, how long do you think a live migration takes? Like, any guess? Half an hour. Yeah. Well, sometimes, like they range from sub seconds to over 18 hours <laughs> in our public cloud. The the reason is like because. Uh, because we have this like, extremely large flavor. We have like, an 8XL flavor. It's 120 gig of RAM and nearly two terabyte disk. And uh, so it's not even like 18 hours occasionally. It's quite reliably over 18 hours, because people don't boot these things up unless they've got some serious work to do, which involves a lot of disk and memory. So, so we found like 18 hours was a pretty reliable figure that we had to work with. So yeah, this is why people say don't do block migration, right? Because it's really slow. Uh, but you know, it's 18 hours, like, go to bed, wake up, finish it. Uh, uh, all right, and we did some functional testing as well. And we found around 30 different failure modes, where we defined a failure mode as just like, we tried it and it didn't work. Some of these are like, actually, if you read the docs, it's not supposed to work. But um, we wanted to really just use like the same tooling across the, the whole cloud, just migrate everything, you know, without having to like, do too much fiddling around depending on what kind of instance we're talking about. So I've got some examples, actually. Um, asynchronous instance operations, which have been started before the migration, completing during the migration, failure mode. Uh, volumes occasionally trying to be attached to the source and the target at the same time. I don't know, race condition perhaps somewhere. Um, instances in unusual states. So live migration, like the, the instance has to be live. But there are different types of live. I mean, in terms of Libvert and Kimu, there's only one type of live. But uh, OpenStack subdivides that into paused and rescued, which are also kind of live as well. Uh, we saw migrations never finishing, right? It's possible that the page dirtying will just never be uh, caught up by the, by the network transfer. Uh, and like, you can do some back of the envelope calculations and work out how much memory I.O. and disk I.O. you need to use before that becomes a problem. And if you do those calculations, you'll be unpleasantly surprised at how inaccurate they are. Because it seems to be that a very small amount of memory or disk I.O. would cause just an endless migration. Right? And you can query libvert through Versh and find out how much is left to go. And that number might just not be going down. I mean, it might even be going up. So yeah. Migration's never finishing sometimes. And failures don't always leave the instance back in the proper state that it should have been in. So it goes. Uh, so these are some uh, of the restrictions which, oh, I've got it down here as well, cool. These are some of the restrictions which we got around by patching the code. The instance must be active, uh, not paused, 
uh, we've had a patch upstream now for migration of paused instances that landed in Kilo. Rescued is a little bit different because uh, when you do a rescue with OpenStack, uh, it boots into a different flavor and uh, attaches the, what used to be the boot disk as, a, as a, like an extra drive. And that flavor might not be the same size. So if you do a migration that goes through the scheduler, it looks to be a different size than it will be when it's unrescued. So you have the problem of how to account for uh, there being enough disk space on the node that it lands on. Right? We didn't have this problem because we were doing, remember, the whole host to the whole host with the same size disk. So we knew it was going to be fine because it was fine before it started. Stopped or suspended, that's not live, right? So you can't live migrate it. But we uh, didn't really want to like, have a very complicated tool chain. So what we do in this case is bring the instance up to paused, live migrate it, and shut it back down again. So there's no CPU cycles take place on the, on the guest OS at all. But this was like we tried to uh, patch this or send this patch back up to upstream Nova, and they didn't really like it. <laughs> Well, fair enough, but it worked for us. Um, error is just like, who knows what's going on. Right? There could be all sorts of things wrong when it's in an error state. Some of them are migratable, some of them aren't. Um, config drive, right? I mentioned earlier that libvert won't migrate you a, uh, if you're doing block migration, libvert won't migrate read-only disks, and config drives are read-only disks. They appear on the guest like CD-ROM drives or something like that. And so you'll find, like, after the migration completes, the instance is on the target, but there's no, like, the backing file for the config drive isn't there. So uh, we patch that in a, <coughs> we patch that. Uh, and attached volumes, the same problem with libvert, the other way around, right? This time, the attached volume is read-write. So libvert will try to migrate it because you're doing a block migration, but it'll migrate it from on the source, where it's attached over here, to on the target where it's attached in the exact same place. So all it'll do is read it out of Cinder and try and write it back into the same place in Cinder, which makes it unsparse. And if anything goes wrong during that process, you've got like a very high risk of data corruption. Um, so like recently, uh, some patches have landed in libvert, which allow a lot more uh, granularity in how you can specify which drives you want to migrate when you're doing a block migration. That's really good to see because uh, that would would have been like great to see 18 months ago. But it's still good to see now, right? Um, so restrictions oh, yeah, that we worked around operationally, the instance can't be too busy, right? I told you about the you know, never-ending migration. Uh, Lorraine, who's just down here, did some good work on interrogating the proc file system to work out in advance if the instance was too busy. Um, and like, what can you do in that situation? You have to just like wait for it to calm down, phone the customer. I don't know, you can't migrate it, so you've got a problem. Um, the keystone token must not expire during migration. That's, cor that's correct, it must not. And if you've got 12-hour keystone expiry and 18-hour migrations, then it's going to happen. And the effect is that the post-live migrate, where it tries to reattach the network and the volumes to the target, that will fail. And then it just everything's rolled back. Like the very last step in your 18-hour process is just nope. <laughs> so <laughs> brilliant. And uh, yeah, I told you about how the block migrate only copies the overlay of the copy on write file. Uh, that means that the image, like the underlay, has to come from somewhere else. And where's it going to come from? Right? It might be cached on the drive on the, sorry, on the target node already, because Nova does a bit of caching of images, and there's only a finite number of them. Or if not, you can get it from Glance. Or if not, like, <laughs> someone has to notice in advance that this is going to be a problem and SCP the image across, uh, which is, like, totally doable, but it's another headache for uh, an operations team. All right, so let's uh, talk in detail about the process that we used to do this rolling migration across the data center, okay? Uh, first of all, like at the per instance level, I mentioned about how uh, async operations can uh, mess you up. So the first thing we do is lock the VM. So this is an admin locking the VM. The user can't do anything to it, and then we just wait. So that anything that was like in flight when we locked it finishes. Like how long? 60 seconds? 
uh, start live migration, and once that's started, which you can find out through the OpenStack APIs, or you can find out through uh, querying libvirt directly. Once live migration start, you can you can uh, unlock the instance again, and then you wait, and the live migration takes place. Like, you know, there's no way in the OpenStack APIs of querying the current status. Right, you have to go to libvirt or to the hypervisor, some other way. Excuse me. Uh, so we, you know, we're like obliged to develop some tooling around this, because, like I mentioned, you know, the, the amount remaining can just like stop going down. So you have to watch it, and OpenStack doesn't let you do that yet. There's work in flight right now to allow that, which is good to see. All right, but anyway, assuming that everything's gone well, the live migration finishes, right, and your instance is finished. So per compute node, which is like you get an empty one which is like up to date with your latest OS and security and firmware and BIOS and what, what you know, the stuff you need. Uh, you then take a source node, which is the one you're gonna upgrade later, you disable it so that no new instances get scheduled to it, right? And then five at a time, we start migration over. Uh, I saw someone from uh, Time Warner saying, not to ever do more than one at a time, but we found five at a time worked, and um, perhaps it's, uh, you know, because we have, like, good network locality for the source and target, or uh, something like that. That was good for us. And then, when they're all done, uh, you can re-enable the target node as a scheduler target for Nova, and then you've got an empty thing that you, you know, the old source you want to, like, upgrade all the stuff on that, like, reboot it. And across the AZ, we have like multiple of these source target pairs of nodes with this going on and on and on. So we've got like dozens or possibly hundreds of migrations taking place simultaneously in these pairs. And uh, the effect is like a beautiful field of corn with you know, a nice breeze going through it. Everything just rolls through nicely. And uh, <laughs> like, what could go wrong? <laughs> Um, well, so I, maybe you've guessed, right? What goes wrong is like any single failure of a migration where you end up with the instance stuck on the source and it won't go off the source makes that node unusable as the next target, right? Because you've got, you can't do anything to it. You can't upgrade it. So like, what do you do? You like, get a red pen and you write, this one does not play nicely with others and you put it in the corner and like you tell someone in ops to have a look at it, and maybe you have to like get someone in support to reach out to the customer and ask them if they wouldn't mind just like, you know, sometime, we remember we're doing this only like three months periodically, so sometime in the next three months, would it be possible to, uh, you know, just arrange for you to reboot that server and we'll like work with you to make sure it comes up on a new node. Like, that's fine, as long as it doesn't happen too often, right? So does anyone want to have a crack at guessing the, <laughs> the success rate for an individual live migration? 80%. 85% of the time. Very good. <laughs> it's like, so I did some maths earlier where I times 85% by itself five times. And so if you start five off at once, you have a less than 50% chance of them all going over successfully. So this thing where you're writing it like this one's no good and you put it in the corner, like this is happening a lot like more than we wanted it to, certainly. 85 is a long way away from 100. And uh, so we had this like ongoing, increasing uh, operations problem. And, you know, in some cases, like a lot of work for the support teams. People are dealing with like dozens of new failures every hour. And, uh, you know, that, I mean, the, the worst that can happen is it, it just slows and st stops the whole process until you figure out what to do with these nodes, and then you've got some new targets and you can restart it. But it's a lot more labor intensive than we were really expecting. Um, so, how about 85% of the time it works? What about the other 15% of the time, right? Why wasn't it working? We did a lot of testing already. We patched the code. We got some like good operational procedures around it. So, what, what could go wrong? <laughs> Um, I group these kind of uh, failures into three classes. Like, firstly, it's possible the migration never, ever starts, right? There could be a problem establishing the peer-to-peer -peer connection between the two hypervisors. Uh, there could be a problem in the pre-live migrate function in OpenStack. 
and the logging in that function is pretty good. It's like usually comes out like starting live migration, migration failed. Okay, that's improved recently. I should, I, I mean, remember this is not like I'm not talking about the latest uh, bleeding edge code that has improved recently, and I'm glad to see it. Um, we use a the same network for live migration as we use for all control plane traffic, which is a different network uh, than we use for like instance to outside world traffic, but still it's the same network that like all the RabbitMQs talk to each other on and stuff. And RabbitMQ is a rich source of comedy if you've got like <laughs> thousands of nodes. Um, and yeah, like hammering it with live migration traffic as well doesn't help. Doesn't help either, either, people, either party. Um, so yeah, failure one, right? It never starts. Failure two, I mentioned earlier, it never stops. Like, <laughs> you've got past the first hurdle and then, mm. So libvert offers you no guarantee when you start a live migration that it will ever finish, right? It offers you the opportunity to set a like, timeout where you can just say, if it takes this long, just give up, cut out. It offers you the opportunity to increase the amount of time that you're willing to totally suspend the instance to copy the last bit of dirty page you know, stuff. I think the default for that is like less than half a second, but I suppose you can increase it to whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but you know, the default is very easily impossible to achieve. So I mentioned it a few times now. It's possible it never ends, right? And the last failure mode is that it does end, but like, not how you wanted it to end. Like, it's migrating. You look away. You look back, and the instance is dead on the floor. Like, what happened to you? Uh, we never replicated this outside of production, and. <laughs> We tried, right? But inside of production, this is a very bad thing to happen because from the customer's point of view, the instance has just stopped dead. Uh, there's no data loss. You can just start it up again, and it comes back up, and it's fine. But like, we're not going to just try it again because if the same thing happens again, we're going to make people very cross. So uh, like, we never got to the bottom of this. It just looks like a hypervisor crash. Uh, there could be like you know, any number of problems. We never replicated it outside of production, and we've only got like a finite amount of customer goodwill to keep just hammering away at this problem in production. So like in the end, this happened, and like that's it, it happened. <laughs> it's a bit worrying. We don't want it to happen anymore. So the upshot is anyway, the instance ends up powered off on the source. So the migration hasn't happened. You can't recommission the node, and uh, you don't really want to try it again just in case. So. Oh, yeah, sad face. Uh, yeah, to do, like replace that with the actual picture. <laughs> um, right, so in the end, um, like, we stopped trying to use live migration like this. It just like, became impractical. Uh, there's like, I've, I'll summarize what you know, I just said, but three main problems like, Operations and support pain caused by the high failure rate, meaning we've got this big pile of doesn't play nicely nodes and instances to deal with. Instances shutting down unexpectedly. You can imagine this is not very popular with people who are paying for those instances. And uh, there is like a, a well-known like performance impact uh, on instances because uh, of uh, you know the fact that you're doing more work on the box. Now, we use some C groups for, uh, for tenant isolation, but we only use C groups for managing the CPU and network bandwidth uh, allocated to each VM. And those two things are actually like completely not a problem for live migration. It's memory IO and disk IO that totally kill it. And they're not C grouped, so as soon as it starts getting bad for one node, sorry, for one instance on a node, it gets bad for all the instances on the node, even the ones that aren't being migrated at the moment. So it's like, whilst this is ongoing, there's like a, an unknown duration period of uh, bad disk and memory performance. We actually found that high CPU activity kind of helped because it was putting the instances, like they were too busy thinking about it to actually ever need to write anything down. Uh, so it cut down on the memory and disk IO that they needed. What's up? All right, so like any good uh, plan, there was a plan B. And um, like, there's two options, but they both involve basically shutting down all the instances, 
doing what you need to the node, and then bringing the node back up with the same instances in the same place, right? So we don't need to migrate anything. We don't need to have the rolling effect. We can do it to the whole data center at once if we want, although perhaps they're a little bit large. Um, so the choices are suspend, resume, uh, or stop, start. So if I put NTP can just recover the system clock, that's not true, right? Because, well, I suppose it can in theory, but uh, a lot of customer workloads are completely like not okay with clock drift of the order that you get for doing a suspend, you know, doing suspend resume. It was, it was really unpleasant. And suspend takes a lot longer than shutdown for some reason. So in the end, stop, start, right? We chose three weekends. We've had one of them already, and there's two more coming up in June, and we're doing like a third of a data center at a time, shut down all the nodes, upgrade them all, restart them. And that has proven to be a lot more popular with customers than like random failures, poor performance, and, uh, and so on. What's up next? Oh, yeah. So we're coming towards the end. Uh, I've got some uh, talk about our future plans, right? Um, we're still pushing some of the changes we made for live migration upstream, and we're still finding that um, Libver is increasing in its capability to do the kinds of things that we struggled with. So some of the things that weren't appropriate when we first tried them now work quite well. It's really great to see testing of live migration has made it into the gate of Nova, so that actually if you put up a patch that has broken live migration, you'll get like a fail job out of it, which means um, hopefully that regressions will become a bit less uh, common and we're really we're going to work hard to make this more robust. Um, we're totally seeing it as like a first class citizen of functionality for uh, the Helion OpenStack private cloud distribution. That's what I'm working on now. And uh, so this week, I think, uh, which is why I don't know very many details about it, but there's been an announcement of uh, a partnership between HP and Intel which I'm pretty excited about. If you saw the Intel guys talking about live migration yesterday, uh, you'll know they know what they're talking about, so I'm pretty pleased about that. Um, and that is actually my last slide, apart from the one that says thank you. But because I'm slightly ahead of schedule, I can give you like an invisible slide, which is um, just some details about a paper that uh, Paul, who's just sat there, uh, showed me about moving workloads around a data center. When I was doing research for this, uh, it was pretty interesting. It's, like, it's well known that the major cost in running a data center is the, uh, the power, right? And especially air conditioning is expensive. And there was some work done by HP Labs which uh, tried to quantify different ways that mobile, like physically mobile workloads around a data center could, uh, could help, right? So one thing you can do is stack all your work in one corner and just chill that corner down and turn off the air conditioning elsewhere. That works quite nicely. Another surprising one was uh, to spread the load out like as evenly as you can, like open the windows and turn off the air conditioning. And if you live in the right climate, that can keep the data center cool enough. So, um, you know, it's still like an exciting uh, thing for a data center operator to do. And it was a little disappointing that our like, beautiful plans didn't come to fruition, but we're still working on it. And uh, it's great if you would join in and help us. What's up? Question, straight away. So um, you were saying about wanting to do this every 90 days. Yes. And, and presumably that's because of HP's um, security policy on applying patches. Correct. But are you hitting things every 90 days that require a restart of the machine? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff that, that can be upgraded that can be in upgraded place, without... I mean, other than, you know, obviously, quite mm. you and the kernel, but, you know, so, or the BIOS, or, you know. So, um, I guess that uh, we were planning, within the, like, 90 days, we were planning for the, the rolling migration to last about a month. And I suppose if we didn't need to do it, then, like, why would we put ourselves through that trouble? Yeah. But it's, it's, you know, it's a, like you say, it's the policy that dictates that it might be necessary. Yeah. So, okay. It's not, yeah. it's not the case that things happen every 90 days. We had to get into the council all the time. We're in the exactly same boat, and we have the same problems. And I wondered, have you ever, have you considered just to bite the bullet and have some shared storage? 
for the all nodes, like Ceph backed nodes, mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. do proper live migration? Um, yeah, so the reason we use the ephemeral disks that's set like on the hypervisor is for every other use case apart from live migration, it seems to offer better performance. So it's... And cost. Yeah, and cost, right? So uh, this live migration plan was like uh, post like data center design, you know, architectural design. And um, so the original design was for, the, yeah, for like speed and cost. Thank Hi. you. It was a great presentation. We, we are in exactly the same position. Yeah. Where uh, are you? At CERN. All right. Um, so shared storage, too costly. Mm -hmm. We are actually doing plan B, but we'd like to do plan A. Mm -hmm. We have to do plan A because we've got 3,000 hypervisors to reinstall with mm -hmm. a new version of the operating system. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very interested in your experiences. And you mentioned some tooling. Are you willing to share that? Um, Nick, are you willing to share that? Lorraine? <laughs> for, for your plan A, which you're getting rid of anyway. Um, <laughs> I think it will eventually Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of it is, um, a lot of it could go out. A lot of it is like we were calling directly into Libvert for stuff that's now available through the OpenStack APIs and it would be out of date. But I, I don't see why not. Um, in fact, you know, that might be a decent idea for a, like a OpenStack ops kind of project. But, That'd be great. Thank right. you. Um, so you, CERN's a private cloud, isn't it? Yeah. So we, um, I don't know how much control you have over what kind of workloads you get. People say live migration is like a, not very cloudy because it's all about keeping your pets alive. But like public cloud, we have no idea what kind of pets are over there. So. It's similar to so, okay. our place. I have no idea what's running on my app. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. More questions? One question, you mentioned about the hypervisors as a base. Mm -hmm. uh, are they just one kind of hypervisor or do you have a mix and match? Sorry? Is it just uh, what kind of hypervisors you're talking about? Um, so we use uh, Libvert KVM like throughout. We use, um, so when you, want, when you want to do a live migration, you want to make sure that the CPU instruction set on the source and target is the same. So some, like I guess the majority of our nodes, we use the Libvert. Uh, CPU model, um, but for a small number, we use like the pass through, and you can't migrate between those two different types uh, because the CPU instruction set is different, so it, you know, it won't work. But I, I guess Libvert probably kicks you if you try and do that; it won't let you. So, right. Hey, so I guess I can echo Cern's response there. So I'm, I work on the Nectar Cloud. Uh -huh. um, and we have the same issues. Uh -huh. um, but I, so I was just a theme. Yeah, you mentioned um, that you had a problem with attached volumes. What, uh -huh. what sort of volumes were they? Um, so these would be not boot volumes, but uh, just data volumes. Um, the problems are right. But is it is it an iSCSI volume or a, oh. or a Ceph volume or something? No, um, Nick, iSCSI, right? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Cool. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, I've seen this problem with Ceph and I, I patched right. it from the bit because mm -hmm. there was just a simple issue. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. So the problem can be like, if you've got two volumes, uh, when the instance arrives on the target, they can have their IDs swapped over because they're just numbered sequentially in like, seems like arbitrary uh, order. I guess possibly the same thing happens with Ceph. I yeah. don't know. All right. Okay, so yeah, a, did you all catch that? There's a there's like a HP public cloud knowledge base article about how to get around that by referring by UUID to the volumes rather than using the auto generated. Right. And you said something about C groups. Yeah. So were you considering trying to throttle the source? So as you started the migration. Is no, we use C groups not for migration but for um, general like tenant isolation. Right, because yeah, we have okay. some pretty noisy tenants. So have, have you tr tried or considered actually changing like the CPU quota on, on the source as um, well starting it off? Well, it's possible, but it's not the CPU quota that's, that, it's not the CPU activity that's, gonna, that's the problem, right? It's the shared memory IO and disk. Yeah, well, so, you can do it for the disk as well, right? But I mean, yeah, but it's like what value memory. do you choose? Because mostly it's kind of bursty activity and you want everyone to just get what they can. and then. Mm -hmm. So, and dynamic C groups, uh, you know, dynamically changing them is quite difficult. 
I yeah. believe. I've never tried it personally. Okay. But, yeah. You all right? Hi. Hello. Um, I'm from Claude Watt, and uh, oh, yeah. public cloud, we have same problem. Oh. <laughs> so we have same open stack. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, have you experienced that uh, if on ephemeral you have a higher IOPS, it get, it get worse? Like uh, if you have a SSD ephemeral or whatever. Ah, right. Yeah, well, so the, during the migration, right, anything that gets written on the source to the disk has to be also sent across the network. So I guess like if you've got a faster disk, then you need to use more network bandwidth to keep up because the pages will dirty more quickly. Um, I don't believe we have any SSDs. I looked down at my colleagues. We don't. So we use like raided, um, spinny, rusty disks. You, you mentioned that you're, you were doing one to one yep. migration. Yep. You tried to, by, by doing that, if you have a, a hypervisor which mm -hmm. are nearly empty, when mm -hmm. you migrate one to one, you go to an hypervisor which is still nearly empty. Mm -hmm. um, have you tried the possibility to combine nodes? Like you have two like nearly empty and you want to, to put on one? Um, no, we didn't. For this use case, we wanted to keep it simple. But that actually is a good idea from the point of view of Windows instances, because we pay a licensing fee per physical sure. CPU, right? So if you can like squish all those onto one host, that would, that would save money. Um, but no, we just did like exactly matching hardware, matching instances, because we don't want any chance of stuff not fitting. We've got other problems. Like <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, customer affinity and anti-affinity rules, which aren't recorded, like, or maybe are now recently have started being recorded with the instance. But, yeah. Thank you. All right. Any more? Anyone else from a different cloud with the same problem? <laughs> no? Okay, well, then I'll call it.